Welcome back to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table uh, with our part B uh, of uh, tonight's presentation. Uh, I want to introduce Dr. Julie Anderson. She is at the Buck Institute in Marin. She's a renowned expert in Parkinson's disease and she is uh, pursuing a wide variety of uh, leads towards treatments, including uh, positive effects of low dosage lithium on aged, aging mice, uh, with uh, human mutation for Parkinson's disease. And there's some other interesting research that you're doing as well, and I think you're right. gonna tell us about that right. now. Thank Excellent, you. thank you. Okay. <laughs> so I didn't realize what a thorough job Ron was going to do, so I have some introductory slides about lithium, but you can just view it as review of you've, uh, what you've been through with Ron. Um, so, the title of my talk is Lithium from Batteries to Brain Disease. Um, as as uh, Ron told you, lithium is the lowest density metal on the periodic table. You can see it up there in the corner. And it's, I think this is probably the picture that you showed as well. It's, it's actually a soft silver white alkali, so basic metal, um, which is really reactive and flammable and you find it, um, oops, oops, okay, well anyway, <laughs> you find it in fireworks <laughs> and you find it as part of these lithium batteries because it allows, it's not only light, but it allows flexibility, um, so it's perfect for uh, modern um, portable devices, so heavily used, used in electric uh, cars, battery operated cars. Um, conversion of lithium to uh, tritium was the first man made nuclear fusion. You can see that it's still used in um, cooling in terms of uh, production of, of nuclear energy. Um, it's also found, um, as Ron alluded to, it's found in, in uh, rocks. It's not found out on its, on its own um, in nature. It's found in uh, natural minimal, mineral springs and it's long been believed to have beneficial health effects. In fact, if you go to this website here, they talk about the history of lithium as crazy water. Um, in terms of the modern origin of lithium as uh, medicinal, it was discovered in um, 1840, or used in 1847 in the UK to, to cre treat gout with lithium. Um, it, it was uh, used as an anticonvulsive. Um, in the US, there were a, a whole series of lithium spas that were set up. Um, and there was anecdotal reports of a cure for dementia. And uh, those of you who are familiar uh, with, with lithium as a medicinal treatment, it has been FDA approved over the last 50 years for the use of bipolar. Um, lithium was used, for example, in uh, Lithia Spring Sanatorium in Georgia, was used um, to treat alcoholism, um, opium addiction, compulsive behavior, now that we sort of um, uh, know of uh, the efficacy of it uses, that sort of makes a lot of sense. We still don't really know uh, exactly uh, what it is mechanistically about lithium that allows for treatment of mania and bipolar. Um, it's not used as much as newer medications, but it's still used as a, as a treatment. Um, in addition to those kind of conditions, it was used uh, to control things like renal calcification up till the 1930s. So um, really where lithium came to the fore as um, a treatment for, or, or an approved treatment for bipolar was in 1949, John Cade in um, Australia reintroduced lithium to psychiatry to treat mania. Um, it turned out that he was just using using it as um, a catalyst to test something else, but he noticed that when he gave lithium to the rats, um, they seemed very relaxed. <laughs> and it was then instituted as a, a treatment for, for mania uh, around 19, 1950. Um, and then 
uh, in the U.S. It was FDA approved for treatment of bipolar in 1970. Turns out that we were the 50th country to do that. It was approved by 50 other countries before we approved it for treatment um, for mania. Um, so we have this 50-year history of FDA-approved usage of lithium as a treatment for bipolar, but over the course of the last decade or so, there's been a growing body of evidence that suggests that in addition to be a mood stabilizer, that it also may have neuroprotective effects in conditions like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, ALS, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about some research that's going on at the Buck Institute. I don't know how many people are familiar with the Buck Institute, um, but we are, to date, <laughs> the only freestanding institute um, studying the biology of aging and age-related disease. We're up in Novato. If you're driving up the 101 and you look um, up to the left-hand side as you're leaving Marin into Sonoma, there's a big white building up there. It's an IMP design building. It's a gorgeous building. We do tours. Please come up and visit us. Um, there's a lot of exciting research going on there. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of research uh, between my laboratory and the laboratory of my husband, Gordon Lithgow. Um, Gordon works on this small organism called C. elegans. It's a little teeny worm. Uh, Ron was pointing out to me that there is a model organi organism exhibit. If you want to see live C. elegans sort of moving around in the microscope, go over and look at them. They are so cute. <laughs> You'll love them. These guys are, are wonderful. Um, it's, it's sort of surprising, but this little worm that has, you know, a thousand X cells, actually there's a lot of conserved biology between what occurs in human beings and what occurs in these guys. There's a lot of evolutionary conservation in terms of um, how, how cells are born, how cells die, et cetera. Um, it's nice for doing things that we're interested in the Bach, which includes looking at lifespan, um, because it has a 20-day lifespan. So it's a very short lifespan. You can do lifespan experiments in a very short period of time. Um, you can produce um, a lot of these worms, they're grown on these bacterial lawns, and, and so you can make a, a lot, you can produce a lot of these guys for experimentation. Um, you know, get your ends, get your numbers up for this. Uh, it's easy to genetically manipulate, so we can basically knock out every gene in the worm one at a time and ask what that does in terms of the function of the worm. It's amenable to drug screening. So in fact, at the Buck, we've used it a lot as a means for we create worm models of disease, and we look for drugs um, that cure the, the phenotypes that we see in those animals. And, um, and I guess I just said that, but it's extensively used to create uh, models of human disease. And the nice thing is that I will say traditionally in my lab, we uh, would move from doing cell culture experiments where we're looking at cells and culture, which is, which is great in terms of a, a simple system to look at what happens biologically. Um, but for somebody like me who's interested in brain function, um, it doesn't really re recapitulate what you see in a live living organism. Neurons in a dish are, are fine for doing drug testing, but to some degree, you really need to know what's going on in a living organism. And so C. elegans as an intermediate until you go into larger mammalian organisms um, is great for all of these reasons. Um, so in Gordon's lab, at the Buck Institute, um, and we were sort of as interesting, we were sort of separately working on these projects on lithium, um, clearly not talking enough science at night to realize that we were both interested in, in metals and aging and age-related disease. Um, in Gordon's lab, uh, 
where they do a lot of drug screening. So in coeligans, it's one of the premier organisms that's used to look for genes that uh, affect aging lifespan. So knocking out a gene that extends lifespan tells you something about the biological process that's involved in longevity. Um, and they were also doing drug screening to look for compounds that were increasing the lifespan in, in these guys. And uh, once you've sort of established that, then you move it on into higher organisms. And they had a paper published in the Journal of Biological Chemistry in 2008 where they had done a screen of natural products to look for things that extended lifespan, and one of the things that worked the best was lithium. Okay, so lithium extended lifespan, and then in a worm model of Alzheimer's disease, they found that, so in, in human Alzheimer's disease, you have the buildup of these plaques and tangles within the brain. Um, and in this worm model, you also see increase of these, this protein buildup, plaques and tangles. You can so, sort of see if you look over at the, um, the green fluorescent, that's a worm that's filled with protein aggregates or, or Alzheimer's related plaques and tangles. And they found that lithium um, prevented the buildup of that hallmark of Alzheimer's disease in this worm model. And it also prevented behavioral defects that you see. These guys sort of become paralyzed as a, as a consequence of having a built up of these protein aggregations um, within the worms. And you could reverse that by treating them with lithium. And this is kind of a traditional survival curve for C. elegans. So we're starting out, we're at the, at the left-hand side, everybody's alive, and you're either treating um, worms with nothing or increasing dosages of lithium. And then, and then Gordon's lab would score every day to see how many worms were remaining. So it's really a survival curve. You're basically every day counting how many worms are left until everybody's gone, right? So survival curve. We, act we also look at this, um, people who study biology of aging, we also look at that, this in terms of human populations, um, where in more developed nations, you have um, ideally what, we're, what we hope to accomplish is um, rather than people uh, dying off like this of various causes, that people live to be 120 and, and then die without morbidity. <laughs> so we don't want people having, we don't want people getting out to 75, having Alzheimer's disease, and then living to 120. So it's not just the length of life. Well, so gerontologists would say it's not just the length of life uh, or, or but it's but it's the the life quality, right? Um, so so silicon is nice in that you can look at both the lifespan, but you can also kind of look at quality of life to some degree in, in these models. And if you look at this, and it's a little bit uh, complicated, but the, the black line is what you see in terms of survival without anything. And then you see with increasing dosages of lithium, the, the worms live longer and longer and longer until you get to the highest do dosage, which is 100 millimolar, and then you start seeing a decrease in life. And this is true with a lot of compounds, if you think about it, that a lot of medications, in fact, where they, you can have sort of this um, biphasic effect where they're useful up to a period of time, but if you get beyond a certain dosage, and this is true with lithium as well, and I'll talk about that. Um, so it turns out that there is a lot of antidotal stories about use of a particular form of lifting called orotate, which is actually sold over the counter. You can go to the drugstore and buy this. And uh, a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease are actually taking lithium. Part of this is because there were reports from the 1980s that suggested that the normal medication or the most common medication um, for Parkinson's disease, which is something called Cinemet, which uh, is really, it's a, so in Parkinson's disease, you're losing a set of neurons within the midbrain in an area called the substantia nigra, um, dopaminergic neurons. Substantia nigra is Latin for black substance. Um, if you look at a, a person with Parkinson's versus an age match control and you just look on a gross, um, pathological exam, you can actually see the loss of those dark 
dopamine-containing neurons. Um, so it, with normal aging, you might lose something like 25% of those neurons. With Parkinson's disease, people lose 90%. Those neurons are important in terms of controlling voluntary motor movement. So when somebody loses those neurons in association with Parkinson's disease, they become kind of frozen in position. They uh, develop a resting tremor, et cetera. If anyone's ever seen the movie Awakenings, those patients were actually given Cinemet um, and it, what it does is that in the remaining dopamine-containing neurons, you're giving somebody an oral precursor which, which crosses the blood-brain barrier and it makes the remaining neurons work harder, so they're making more dopamine. So it's kind of dealing with the symptoms because you need that dopamine for movement, but it's not stopping the cell loss. So currently we don't have any cure um, for Parkinson's disease. We're just dealing with the symptoms and we're making the cells that are remaining work harder, but you're still having cell loss. So after a period of time, those medications stop working. Okay. Um, so uh, there was some antidotal evidence and then some scientific studies in the 1980s. Um, so one of the problems with dopamine um, is that somebody who's Parkinsonian has too low a level of dopamine. So you give them L-dopa, you increase the level of dopamine, here's the kind of homeostatic per perfect level, you give them um, L-dopa and levels shoot up here <laughs> and down. And so it's, it's something because the turnover of dopamine is so rapid, it's very hard. We'd like to keep it at this level, but it's very difficult to do. So. So often people who are Parkinsonian who are taking Cinemet, which is to date kind of one of the, the best medications that you can take in terms of controlling symptoms, are kind of going like this, right, around this mean. So when, you're, when you have too low dopamine, you're sort of frozen in position, you're having trouble initiating voluntary motor movement. When you're too high, you have what's called a dyskinesia and you have sort of uncontrolled movements. And if you've seen um, somebody on Parkinsonian medication, often what you notice this is kind of dyskinesia because they're having trouble controlling it. That's medicine induced. And it turns out that lithium um, seems to control that dyskinesia to some degree. Um, so there was a lot of uh, interest in using lithium in terms of an adjunct to the drug related effects that you see. Um, the problem with lithium, or at least for bipolar, is the amount of lithium that somebody needs to take um, to quell the manic episodes in bipolar are often at a level that kind of borders on being toxic. Um, and there are a lot of side effects. The normal sort of uh, sera range, or when, when a patient is being treated with lithium for bipolar, um, they'll try to get you into a, a certain range, which seems to, I mean, it varies from individual to individual, but they'll try to get you in, into a specific range, um, which seems to be efficacious for most people. They have to kind of mess around to find out the range. They're trying to keep you here. If you get it, if it's too high, you end up with side effects like hypothyroidism, um, kidney failure. Uh, if you go way high, you can actually end up with dyskinesia. So you can end up with something that looks like Parkinson's disease. Um, but there are all of these um, studies that uh, have come to the fore in the last um, three to four years that have suggested that if you give a lower level of lithium where you're, you're not in the range where you're worried about these toxic effects, that it actually may be neuroprotective. And that's important because we're talking about um, not just dealing with the symptoms, but actually stopping the cell loss um, with lithium treatment. And uh, so in my laboratory, at the same time that Gordon's laboratory was looking in the worms and looking at lifespan, and the nice thing about the worms is you can also, because they can be genetically manipulated, you can kind of figure out what um, the drug is doing that's causing it to be efficacious, and you can, um, you can look for other drugs that have the same effects, but not the same toxicity. So that's uh, one um, great use of, of C. elegans as a model. 
Um, in the meantime, in our laboratory, we were looking in some mouse models of Parkinson's disease. So we can um, make a mouse Parkinsonian. We can give it the human genes. There, so a Parkinson's disease, by and large, is sporadic, meaning there's no family history. People end up um, with Parkinson's disease. But in a small percentage of people, 5%, um, it's genetically inherited. So only 5%, but genetically inherited where um, you know, your parents have, have the gene and it's passed on. But it's, that's very, very rare. Um, but those, ki those genetic forms are heavily studied because we hope it's going to tell us what happens in sporadic form um, as well. And so, so in these Parkinsonian mouse models, we can actually express these human genes. And with aging, we can actually elicit Parkinson's disease in these mice. And in a couple different models um, of the disease, uh, we actually found that giving low dosages of lithium um, over a period of time prevented both this loss of these dopamine neurons in the midbrain. And um, another feature of Parkinson's disease is like plaques and tangles in Alzheimer's disease, you form these proteinaceous um, deposits called Lewy bodies uh, after Dr. Lewy who discovered them. And they're sort of a characteristic if you go in at autopsy and you look at the Parkinsonian brain, you see these Lewy body deposits. So in these mouse models, we were able to prevent the dopaminergic cell loss and we were also able to prevent the protein aggregation. So you can see this is sort of similar to what we see in the worm model. And probably the most exciting thing for us was that it prevented the motor loss so just like in human patients, these mice develop um, problems with motor movement, and we have several different behavioral tests that we can use in mice um, to uh, monitor this motor behavior. And so for example, we have something, if you, if you look up to the top left, this is called open field analysis. So it's basically a plexiglass box where you have laser beams um, shooting through the box. You put the mouse in there for 10 minutes and you're tracking its movement. Um, so um, in A, this is showing uh, on the left-hand side is a control mouse, a Parkinsonian mouse. You see this loss, its number of floor moves, so its amount of movement. And when we treat with lithium, we prevent that loss in motor moves. Um, another test we use is something called the pole test, which is basically, again, you see over here on this side. So you put a mouse on top of this pole, and you see how long it takes it to turn around and how long it takes it to move down the pole. It's a pretty accurate test for for motor movement. And we can see that the amount of time, again, in B, there's control. The white bar is the Parkinsonian mouse. It takes it a lot longer to um, move down the pole. And that's prevented um, by treating them with a slow dose lithium. Um, and the last test that we perform is something called the cylinder test, where you put the mice inside of the cylinder and you look at numbers of spontaneous rearing. And um, actually, the, the loss in spontaneous rearing um, is reversed when you treat with lithium. So this seems a little, but we, but we have fairly accurate behavioral tests to look in these animals to monitor uh, motor movement, and excitingly, not only are we seeing a prevention of the neuronal cell loss, but they're actually recovered in terms of the motor movement. Um, and one of the most exciting things about this was that uh, the lithium data from the Buck Institute um, actually inspired a large epidemiological study in Japan that was a, it was a one million person study where they looked epidemiologically at people exposed to trace lithium in the water versus, in essence, negligible lithium in the water. And they found that this promoted human longevity. So there's some probably basis in reality to think that maybe the crazy water wasn't so crazy and in fact that it probably does have some positive effects. What those are, we don't really know right now. Um, but starting with silicones, where we can manipulate genes and do drug screening, we can get more of a handle on what's going on. Um, we're very excited in uh, trying to identify what we call lithologs, which are 
you know, drugs that, are, that have the same actions as lithium without the toxicity, and we have a lot of research um, in that area. And that's our beautiful institute. I would invite you to come up and visit. We do have tours. Um, it's, you know, it's up in Nevada, so it's a little bit of a drive, <laughs> but it really is um, a, a lovely institute, and we're excited about what we're doing, and uh, we, we love to have visitors, so please come up and see us. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Anderson. So once again, we'd like to thank Dr. Anderson for coming here. It's really <laughs> exciting research. It gives me ideas about my lithium chloride right here. Um, but I think I will not be salting my food. Uh, once again, we have uh, coming up on the 26th of this month, full spectrum science radiation. On the 19th of next month, we have uh, Everything Matters, uh, Tales from the Periodic Table, Beryllium. And uh, we'll again be taking a break in April and resume in May with Boron. Um, and we want to thank you for coming to uh, Everything Matters. And uh, we'll take some questions uh, off mic for, from our audience here. <laughs>